for showing up. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we are on our second meetup, and thank you all for supporting this community and, and, and showing up in time. Really appreciate it. You guys are rock stars, and hopefully we'll get the same support from you guys moving forward. Uh, before we get to our amazing talk, so sorry for this cheesy image actually, I didn't find anything. Uh, so before we get to, uh, to our main uh, meet for the day, let's I have some, some home training to do. So firstly, I would also like to thank Hack Reduce for giving us this, this awesome place where we can hang out and, and talk about some fun technologies. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Cognizius for stepping up and uh, giving a free book raffle uh, for every of our meetups. So this for this one we have predictive analytics. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing book, and we have picked uh, from the attendees a couple of names that we'll shout out at the end of the meetup. And if you exist in this and you're still not sleepy or whatever, so you have yourself a book. Awesome. And also a shout out to A to C uh, for being our amazing host for food and drinks. Really, really appreciate it. And I think we have Matt uh, from A to C. He'll give a quick pitch. Uh, if you want. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll never set that over my in my life. Yeah. Hey guys. Uh, the shots that I'm at from A to C. Uh, we do a lot of, you know, big data project work, both in the Philadelphia and Boston areas specifically. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna have some of our guys speaking next month that are much more technical than I am, but I just wanted to, you know, thank all of you guys for coming. We're happy to be part of this event, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys next month, November 14th. All right? like data, you are in the right place. We host events all the time here, meetups, workshops, training events, hackathons. Um, check out our calendar. It's online at hackerys.org slash calendar. Call us on Twitter. Um, we have a ton of hackathons. And um, the next one is uh, travel data. It's, uh, we have four data providers, uh, competitors even, that are bringing their data um, and making it available just for the weekend for uh, people to take a look at. We have um, cloud computing, secure, it's gonna be really fun. So October 19th, check that out. Um, if you have any questions about the space, I'll be here. And thank you guys for coming tonight. I don't want to waste further time. I would like to introduce Tanya. Uh, Okay, um, I'm not Tanya, but I'm about the size of Yoda, so that's um, what I, My name is Josh Walker. I'm the COO of Comlink Data. Um, and before I hand the microphone over to Tanya to walk you guys through uh, some of the applications we're building and to do some uh, workshop style stuff with you guys, um, I wanted to give you the context for why we hired Tanya. I think that's kind of relevant to you guys. Um, and sort of the problems that we're trying to solve and why we think about using this technology in the first place. So I'll be brief because I'm not the uh, technical person, um, but I wanted to give HackReduce uh, and this meetup kind of a sense of, of what it means when we say big data in the uh, space of telecom. Okay, so um, uh, Comlink Data is a company that um, both Tanya and I are from, and what we do is we follow people who switch telecom companies. So you switch um, from AT&T to T-Mobile, or you switch from Sprint to Verizon, we see that transaction. So we watch people that are switching wireless carriers, and we see 100% of those transactions that occur every day. And just to give you a sense of how big that data stream is, we see about 50 to 60,000 transactions a day. Okay, so that in and of itself is not high velocity big data, but it's big data if you start looking as far back as we do, which is back to 2004. We capture all that historical information, and we have to look at that information in a bunch of different ways to try to figure out trends in the marketplace, etc. Okay, so that's the big data that comes in. What we do then is because we have to provide solutions to the carriers themselves, we have to tell them something they don't know. 
or we're trying to sell something to Best Buy or Radio Shack or Target or anybody else that carries cell phones, we have to append really smart data to that core transactional data set. And so what you see here is what we call basically our supplemental data sources. And just to give you a sense of what's structured and unstructured data, the advertising spend is something we license from a company called Canton. So that comes in terms of unit data. Um, you can look at how much data, uh, how much advertising spend was um, in a particular geospatial area. So it, it's both geo-targeted data and um, financial data for the advertising market. Then we have demographic data. That's census data that we've incorporated so that we can tell what races or income brackets are moving more predominantly than others, right? So a new promotion comes out from at and Did that move Asians more than it moved Blacks? Did that move high-income consumers more than it moved low-income consumers? Then you have device data, event data, and social media data. We're not doing pure set, uh, sentiment analysis, but we are doing some natural language stuff where we're trying to figure out when somebody tweets something like, I just switched to Verizon. Was that a positive statement, a negative statement? Did it have anything to do with coverage in their area? Or did it have to do with a new phone coming out? So we look for words that kind of give us hints and um, some intent on the consumer's part. Okay, <clears throat> any questions about this? So before I even mention things like Hadoop or SQL or anything else like that, I think about this as the complication of our data system. So when I'm interviewing candidates and when I'm thinking about what we need to hire for our team, I think about people that have very different data skills, right? Some people need to be able to ingest, transform, load this stuff. Some people need to be th think creatively about how to integrate these different data sets. And then obviously some people need to be very good at visualization. Yeah. So where do you collect the data? Is there any central database? Or there yeah, database? there's nothing that's centralized for sure. In fact, the company's three years old and we spent the first two years figuring out how to bring all of this together. So um, the underlying database is the actual network that helps people route their phone calls. Um, there's a bunch of different databases out there that make the telecom industry work. Um, the founder of the company, former uh, telecom uh, management consulting guy, just knew that this data was out there, but you have to make sense of it all. So there's a lot of bad data, a lot of it's dirty, you have to clean it up, we have to figure out what it says. And once you get that all into the core system, which is the middle you know, database, we can start appending all the supplemental databases to it, it makes sense. Yeah? So how much data do you have about the persons in each transaction? Do you have like their name, address, and all that stuff? Well, that's a really good question. So the question was, how much data do we have about each transaction? And the the real answer is we have the telephone number and the carrier, the win, winning carrier and the losing carrier, and then we use all this other supplemental data to derive other information about that uh, transaction. So we have no PII. Okay, so how do you So Tanya can talk a little bit more about that, but we get, we also. Um, you know, we're using the census data. So we're using, we were using deciles, and we've changed the way that we're doing that so we can actually figure out what area of the population is moving based on where the number is. And those numbers are usually assigned to what are called rate centers, which is where a phone number moves um, and gets ported through when it, when it actually gets signed up. So we, we, can, we can assign it to a geographic location and then learn about that geographic area um, based on that. Yes. Do you build any prediction models to see who might be likely to switch? Yeah, so um, the question was, have we done any predictive analytics? And we've done some. Um, we do it more on client requests than we do um, make this sort of a predictive model. This is, this is supposed to be more of a real time. We, we position it and we sell it as a real time um, competitive intelligence solution for the wireless industry. So we're not trying to predict churn. We know that this data can probably be instructed into what's kind of happening next, but um, we're not spending a lot of time doing that. Okay, um, so what I want to do too is, because Tanya's gonna get into the real details, I want to give you a very high uh, overview of the architecture here. Uh, we have recently started working much more with the cloud. Um, we've started to run some of the new jobs. Um, we're starting to uh, convert some of our stuff into pig. Um, so that we can do some more data flow, uh, you know, work on, on the front front end of our system here. But 
the, the back end is still very heavy SQL, and we have a lot of folks that are still doing a lot of SQL. Um, so that's the core of the system, and as we move sort of um, into the Redshift environment, we're using more and more of, of the uh, Hadoop and um, Pig and, and uh, languages like that. Um, we, we are also, if you take the application query stuff, we're, we're building our own front end. Um, we just believe that we have to deliver customized solutions to the, the business user. The business user wants to see our data in a way that perhaps <coughs> Tableau or, or Cognos or any of these off-the-shelf tools can't really allow them to customize. So we're building our own front end, um, and so some of the stuff Tanya will show you is how we prototype rapidly to get to the type of solution that we want for our user. And that's really what our Shiny, I think, has been so helpful to me as a business user when Tanya can whip something up very quickly and say, hey, would it be good to look at it this way, or would you could be user want to see it this way? And it's given us enormous flexibility from that perspective. Okay, so with, without further ado, I will um, sort of introduce Tanya to go through sort of how we're using our Shiny in our environment and how we're very excited to be using our studio as well um, when that's ready. Um, I look at both of those things from a technology perspective is if there's support for those, if they're production ready, um, we want to be using those technologies because they've given us enormous flexibility to prototype applications. So I think they would be um, really welcomed by our clients in a, in a production environment. Um, Tanya is, uh, is, is phenomenal. Um, she does a bunch of different things that are great. Um, she not only helps us figure out how to build our applications, but she does a, a bunch of cool stuff on the side. She's a big sports fanatic, so she'll show you probably some application or she'll at least reference it. She's super psyched about it, where you can do your fantasy draft um, stuff using this stuff. Uh, which is really cool. And she also has a really cool application that I looked at before I hired her when I was recruiting her, which is called Music Roamer, and it allows you to very much kind of semantically look at the different bands and how they're associated with each other. So if you go in and you pick U2, you see all the bands that are associated with U2. It's pretty cool. She pulls it all off and blasts at them. Um, it's cool, cool stuff. So I think you're going to enjoy this talk, and um, I didn't stand up because I was going to be able to hold the microphone. We are looking for great people. We are looking for rock stars. Uh, if you want to chat with me, I'm happy to uh, talk with you later. Tanya. Run on your data, all of the hard work, and then 
those smart people have done it for you. So chart right there is actually uh, our packages that have been contributed over time. And you can see there's this kind of perfectly power parabolic uh, pattern where they're just it's skyrocketing. And I want to say right now there's about 5,000 contributed packages. Um, I, I want to say 1,500 or so are purely for bioinformatics. And I started bioinformatics, which is why I started out uh, using R. So this next chart is showing the number of posts that are R related on the left. SAS is next, SPSS and Stata. And the different colors are cross validated, <coughs> stackoverflow.com, and talk stacks. Massive difference. The last one is R. Uh, posts, percentage of posts on Stack Overflow in the blue versus SAS in the red. And some of you, a lot of you are probably familiar with SAS, SPSS. Um, you know, they're proprietary paid for solutions. They, to my knowledge, don't have as much of a community contributed uh, package as R does. And I think that's part of the reason R is getting so much popularity is that it does a lot of that hard work for you. It's also free. So the price is always right, especially in startups where we're obviously strapped for cash. So here are some more reasons why. Uh, I personally always advocate for using R in any type of data-oriented startup or company. Number one, your code will be testable. There are packages called RUnit. Uh, there's something called test that, and you can write unit tests to test all of your code. Does anyone remember the London Whale affair in 2012 with JP Morgan? So there was something like a, they reported a $2 million loss, but it was probably close to the, their sick people. Analysts were saying five to six billion. Uh, and it was, we, they believe partially due to uh, Excel error. So a financial analyst was building a value and risk model in Excel, copying and pasting a bunch of values. There's obviously no version control or auditing or tests unless you're writing macros. And I don't know who wants to do that, not me. Um, so testing is very important. Not only that, but reproducibility. You can comment your scripts. There's multiple ways to ingest your data, be it through flat files, uh, databases, via ODBC or JDBC, R curl if you want to just call some uh, data from the web. Uh, whereas if you just got Excel or SQL statements, no one can just take your script, put it onto their computer, run it, and get the exact same result. It's much harder, especially if you're pulling all kinds of disparate data sources, which we all know is a pretty common thing. And lastly, it's scalable. Uh, what's the row limit? And right now, Excel does anyone know? Column limit? So no one uses Excel? Cool. <laughs> yeah, there's some kind of limit. Uh, you, hit, you, you hit limits. Um, a million rows. A million rows, OK. Tableau Public can give you a million rows nowadays, which is pretty. I, I'm, not, I'm not just an Excel hater. Excel is good for what it's, it's made for, and I think it's made for iterating quickly and doing things on the fly and building um, you know, tools that are maybe used for yourself. But anything that's going to be used in production needs to be testable, reproducible, and scalable. And the scalable aspect of R is that you've got all these packages that, that do parallelization for you across distributed systems, such as the ones I listed here. So, what I've noticed, and probably a lot of you noticed, we've got two sides of the spectrum. We've got web developers, and then we've got data analysts like me, who just love data, get into the data, hack my way around Perl, Python, R, but I know nothing about, I can, I, I can modify CSS and HTML, and I was a PHP, but to build a web app from scratch, it's going to take me a lot of time. I need to learn a lot of different skills, especially if you do it properly. Uh, so, Point. The point being here is that we've got these two exclusive, mutually exclusive sets of skills, right? But all these companies are being, they're more and more focused on data. They're more and more data-centric. Either your product is your data, or you're a company that wants to use internally generated data to optimize business decisions making, or um, just optimize, optimize the way you do data data business. So finding people with both sets of skills, I think, is very rare. You're a unicorn if you have both of those. You can build a you know, full-blown scalable website as well as run some crazy Bayesian uh, classifier. I think teams and product teams will be better off actually using tools such as Shiny. So 
Shiny is basically a framework that allows you to build web applications in R, no JavaScript, no HTML, no jQuery, and you can have fully functional, um, interactive web apps. It was developed by the guys at RStudio. Now some of the features, uh, it's easy to use, at least I think, uh, because they have all these readily available widgets, which you'll see. Uh, there's no HTML, JavaScript, or jQuery, like I said. Um, there's this fast bidirectional communication, which really just means uh, R can directly interact with the web page without going through server or middleware, so it's, it's fast. Uh, it uses Twitter Bootstrap, which a lot of you are probably familiar with if you have done any type of development. Uh, it's just give you really nice CSS templates and lets you lay things out nicely so it looks looks nice. And it uses a reactive programming model, which I'll talk about next. So reactivity is something I'm, I think I'm still wrapping my head around, but the whole idea of reactive programming is that you have these sources, uh, reactive conductors, which I won't talk about right now, keep it simple, and reactive endpoints. And the simplest structure you'll typically see is a re reactive source uh, to a reactive endpoint, where most of the time a reactive source is going to be something like an input on a web page, so a slider, a drop down, and your reactive endpoints are going to be your plots and your tables. And reactive programming is basically the idea that you have reactive values, which could be like your input on a web page, and then you have reactive expressions. <coughs> and reactive expressions keep track of these reactive values. So whenever these reactive expressions are executed, uh, they'll automatically keep track of what reactive values they've already read. So as soon as those dependencies change, uh, the reactive program model knows what it needs to update. So as an example, as soon as you change an input on a web, on our shiny app, goes through and looks at all the plots or tables that are dependent on it, and updates them as it sees fit. And you don't have to worry about any of that. Typically, you'd have to write event handlers and deal with moving data back and forth. So that's a, a nice feature. And I'll show, I'll show an example of that as well. So before we actually look at um, an R app, there are some other libraries I wanted you to just be aware of that are at your disposal that are really cool. Uh, R charts is one, and what it does is it allows for building D3.js charts. Right? Are you guys familiar with D3? So instead of having just static plots that R can produce, you can use just R code. So that simple formula right there actually generates D3 that JS code, it's fully interactive, you can plop it into our Shiny app, much sexier than just using ggplot or some of the basic plotting functions. Another really cool library that I've been using is Google Viz, and this just basically allows you to access the Google Charts API from R. Uh, on the left, you see a typical core plot map where you can overlay values onto the geographic locations. Uh, and on the right is the Google Motion Charts, uh, which you guys have probably seen. If not, I, I'll probably run it. actually have a demo of that I can show later. But things move and you can change values and parameters, so again, it makes your app a lot more interactive. And no JavaScript or coding necessary. It's all still, you're still in R. The nice thing also about this app is that, or sorry, this package, is that you don't have to upload your data to Google, and typically using Google Charts, you do. So you can do it all in the security and safety of your production environment. So you can write all of your UI, or your, it's, it's technically your, your UI.r file, we'll get to that, in R. But if you were the type that does know JavaScript or jQuery or CSS and you want more flexibility, uh, you could define an HTML UI. Uh, file instead. So typically you just have a server.r file and a ui.r file. But instead you change up your directory structure to what's on the upper right corner and you pop an index.html file in there instead of ui.r. And you can see that the code, it just goes from, we've got our code here and you can get the same result using html labels and options. 
So if anything now is a good time for everyone who wants to follow along. Um, we can start up R and build the shiny app. R Studio. Yep, R Studio. So there's the server.r, and I, I like Sublime Text personally, because you can do these cool things like lay out, uh, have two columns and lay out your, your view however you want. So server.r is the file on the right, uh, ui.r is on our left. And right now I just kind of have the bare bones uh, structure set up. So if you're following along, you can just set, set up your two files, server.r, ui.r, put them in the same directory. And then on server.r, we start off just loading the Shiny library. And then we initiate a Shiny server. So this side of the code is doing all of your kind of back-end computation. This is where we put our, our code that does the stuff that we want. The UI, the R, is where we put our code to display widgets and components. So the Shiny server function takes an input and an output. And this input object is referring to inputs that we're going to specify here, such as uh, numeric inputs, checkbox inputs. And the output is going to uh, specify the plots and the tables that we want to render based on those inputs. How are you opening that server.r? Uh, it's just a text file. You can, just, you can oh, start two new blank files uh, and save them as server.r. You might have to open them in any text editor, your, your favorite text editor. All right, so does everyone, does everyone have that? Let's follow along the server.r part of this. Just stop me if, if it's too fast. I'm going to get rid of this for now. And now on the UI.r side, we have our shiny UI, which is going to start referencing Twitter bootstrap components. So the page with sidebar tells us that we want a page with our, selected, our, our selection menus on the left, uh, 
we've got our sidebar panel. Our header panel just displays a, a title, where, which we're calling test. And then there's the main panel, which displays all of our charts and data tables. So that's, the, that's just the, the bare bone skeleton of the app. So if you've got that all set up, save the two files. Does everyone, does everyone need that back up? Uh, you don't need the comments. Just, just I'll get rid of those. Any questions so far while we're waiting? So if you're, you've got those two files saved, what you want to do is navigate to set your working directory to wherever you save them. So I saved mine in a folder called Reactivity. And you're just going to load up, make sure you load up the Shiny package using Library Shiny. And then you're going to call Run App. And that just says, that's just saying to run the app from your current working directory. So here's what it looks like so far. Uh, there's nothing there because all we specified was the header, but the like, the components are actually there. We just haven't put anything into them yet. So we can we can get to that part. So then we're having issues with that. Are you able to run it? Alright, so we're gonna just take a, a sample R data set called Faithful, which is a built-in R sharing app, or sorry, R data set that looks like this. So we've got eruptions and a, a waiting variable. I'm not sure what it means, but we're going to use this data set because it's, it's built into R, uh, easy to use. So let's. Let's display a histogram of that. We do hist <laughs> eruptions. And we get a histogram that shows you uh, the eruptions. And it's in R, which is great, but we want it in our R shiny app. So what we'll do is we'll go over to shiny server. And we'll specify our output object. We're going to call this plot out. 
and we're going to give it this uh, reactive value, which is really just a plot. So, so far, does this make sense? We're connecting the input up objects to the output objects in server and UI. Alright, so next, uh, we have to tell Shiny that we want to plot in our main panel, which is our most of our real estate on our screen. So here we're going to say, we're going to reference our, uh, sorry, a function called plot. Output, and then we have to give the name of our plot 
uh, which is plot out. And if you want, this is where you can also specify a width option. So I'll just give it to 700. Sorry. And save. So now I'll go back to R and I'll just run my app again. Alright, so the syntax error was in server.r. So, Supposed to be one after eruptions? Oh no, thank you. This is a weird angle. Okay. Good eyes. Alright. So now we've got something that we can actually work with. So we've got our plot, we've got our on the left there underneath test. That's our side panel. Test is part of our header panel. The histogram is part of our main panel. And we can actually interact with the data now. So if I want to change this number of breaks, I'll say 100. You get more granularity in the histogram. And I might want to show those individual observations, which you can see these little lines might be tough to see, but underneath, above the numbers, they appear disappear. So that's just uh, the plotting part. Are there any <coughs> issues with that? Panel 
that you can provide, which is all here. And what this does is there's a bunch of tags. There's a tags list which will basically transform all of these tags. So a head tag, for example, or a title tag. It will actually transform them into HTML tags, heads, titles. And you can provide references like this. So here's our style sheet. And I'm going to give it this app.css file, which actually just lives uh, in the same directory as your server.r and ui.r, but you should have a www directory within that. And in that directory is where you put your CSS file. So we save that, but then we have our custom header. We have our header panel right here. Instead of the generic default one, we need to replace that with a custom header panel. So now I'll reference that and it'll give us, it'll pull in our CSS file. And just to give you a, an idea of what that looks like, I've got it loaded right here. Uh, this, this well is our menu uh, right here. So that's specified in this object and I found that out just by inspecting the different elements. Uh, so right here, you can see it says form, the class is well. So we know in the CSS that's what it's referencing. I don't like how long it is. There's a bunch of unnecessary space there. So I'll uncomment this and let's make it 250 pixels. Really basic CSS. I, I really don't know much when it comes to CSS. And now to refresh, it looks a lot better. So that's that's kind of the way I go about it. There's, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Uh, I highly recommend Put the code back up if anyone's finishing up. I highly recommend uh, using the R Shaggy Google group. So they were really helpful and supportive for me when I was going through learning all of this. There's an R Shaggy tutorial on their site, which basically has the same example. I just I might have modified it a very little bit. Uh, but the guys on the Google group, uh, I think Joe Chang, uh, Winston, they're, they're really helpful. They work in our studio and they develop this stuff, and they're just doing an awesome job. They, They've been super helpful for me, so I highly recommend it if you want to start getting more fancy. Uh, and I think lastly, I'll just sum up with showing a couple of fully fleshed, fully fleshed out examples. So I've got three apps I want to show. Uh, and let's see. I can actually just run them locally. So the first one is a, an app where we're collecting Twitter data. Which allows you, it, it, instead of updating immediately as you change 
different options. It will wait until you press that submit button, which is really useful. Uh, so what this is showing is a Google Viz uh, map, and it's showing wind shear for Verizon in 2013, the second quarter, by DMA, which is a direct marketing area. It's what marketers use to target their customers. And another thing I did not get to get into was uh, an RTRX component called data tables. And this is, if you're familiar with uh, jQuery, JavaScript, data tables is a really popular way to show data in, in grids like this. I can search, uh, I can specify the number of entries, I can sort columns, you know, page through, and again, just no JavaScript. So I, I, it's really cool. Um, use the package if you can, contribute to it if you're very ambitious, please do. It makes people like me look like web developer rock stars. Um, the last one is just a, what Josh mentioned, a kind of fun project. This is, this is my first app that I built. Um, a lot of late nights with fantasy football data and beer and anticipating the Patriots season. So personal blog, I run the sports data this blog where I, I play with sports data and visualize it. And I think I have internet, so it should be loaded. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, this was really, I just dove in at first and uh, learned, I wanted to do this. I, wanted, I had the data. I was scraping uh, fantasy football mock draft data from fantasyfootballpros.com. And I had it all on a Postgres database on Amazon. Uh, on AWS, and I was like, well, I need to do something with this data. So that's, that was my way of diving into R-Shine and really learning what the heck I can do with it. So I've got, I believe it was 19,000 mock drafts, uh, which is some 3 million plus different picks. And I took the data, and in R, I actually calculated how many times each player was drafted before another player, and then they were given a power index. So, Adrian Peterson, obviously, number one in drafts in most leagues. He has the highest power index. Everyone else is ranked, you know, descending order here. So, as I'm drafting, and say I want to draft uh, wide receivers, I can filter. They're all, they're all sorted by power by default. And then you can actually visualize, this is just a GG plot. plot. I, I can see the average power remaining by position. So, as you're drafting, you can actually say, well, Captain Johnson was drafted, he'll disappear, and then your chart gets recalculated. So that's an example of reactive, the reactive model. As soon as you uh, trigger these inputs, those reactive expressions know that they need to update themselves if they're dependent on those inputs. And then just to show you how I leverage uh, our charts, I wanted to compare two players. So maybe it's time to pick a quarterback and you just have no idea who you should pick, or you've got two in your, your head that you're going back and forth on. And for fun, let's just do Eli Manning versus Tom Brady. All right. Uh, Tom Brady is the black. And this is average draft position on the left. So he was drafted, uh, Eli Manning was drafted 0.165% of the time before Tom Brady. Uh, that's just a text object that you can use. Um, it's called a rendered text. This is another data table. And this is uh, one of the R charts that you can use to generate these cool interactive charts. So I can filter, I can hover over and get a, a tool tip. And then I've also got these tabs, so RShine allows you to, to incorporate different, different windows and different, notice that when I go to compare two players, the options change. So you can, there's really a lot of flexibility. Uh, I think it's, it's really a tool that's changing the way that data teams are going to work together with development product teams. Um, I'm able to whip these up pretty quickly and allows our internal users to test, maybe refine the, the requirements or figure out if there are any bugs. But it really lets your data team focus on what they're good at and what we can do. They can then present their analysis and then allow your QA and testing to be done. When you've got your kind of final uh, specs and requirements, ship those off your product team. Now you save yourself some iterations because the data team already really hammered down what, what they want to do. Uh, so that's it. If anyone has any questions,
feel free now. You can talk to me after. So that's something called uh, lookup conditional panel. And then uh, that basically allows you to, to you name the different tabs. And it'll say if the tab is you know, tab two, and then you can provide it all of the parameters here just like you would. That code is actually also all available on my uh, GitHub. So let's do this. So if you go to uh, gist.github.com slash tcash21. Um, yeah, hold on. I just gotta load it. Okay. So here's the code for the fantasy football app. Uh, I've got my CSS at the top. But let's go down to the conditional panel. This is a global.r, which I didn't mention, uh, allows you to, to specify variables or any type of data that you're going to use across your application. Uh, and server, as well as UI, has access to them. And it just loads them once at startup, and then you have them. Uh, now this code is a little bit different because I'm actually using uh, Postgres and I'm querying a database. This was when I originally just used R objects for the data, so it wasn't as dynamic, it was just static objects. But the main ideas are still here. So this is my server.r. Uh, let's go down to the UI, because that's where the conditional panel is. All right, so you can see here, I've got a conditional panel. And then I say condition equals, and you give it your input, and then the tab, this is your tabs one, is your, kind of your list of tabs, and you just give it the actual name of the tab. So when I compare two players, I have all of these different uh, parameters. And then you can just specify another conditional panel. This is my, my power by position, my first panel. And again, specify all of the things that you want to show. And here's what the tab set looks like. It's just a tab set panel, and you provide it multiple tabs. You're running this all on your single machine, right? <coughs> it should be able to be able to run the Shiny on a server and have your, um, your application running on it. Yeah, so I was running uh, the demos you saw on my local machine, but fan the Fantasy Football app was hosted on AWS. And uh, at Comlink Data, we actually also use AWS. I've configured our Shiny server uh, on that instance, and we firewall it to our office so we can actually act, and our office can access it through a URL. Now, is that a lot more complicated? It's actually not that bad. There's a bunch of tutorials out there. Uh, someone wrote an AMI, which is fully configured for, I think, Ubuntu, or a Linux AMI, uh, with our Shiny already configured. So there's a couple walkthroughs out there that you can, you can look up and um, I could also, I could comment where they are on the meetup afterwards. Yeah? With the, um, the data for, like, um, capability, like, with charcoal, is that something you can set up? What's that? Uh, drill down? Like, yeah. If you're going to drill down, you can set that up, pre set it up in the data set. And then the other question would be, you had a, a drill down that's not a direct drill down, that's for grouping or something like that, you're actually going to a different so are you thinking along the lines of, you know, we've got some inputs on the left-hand side, and we want to drill down into maybe from states to cities to... Right. You know, I haven't done that, but I, I'm sure it's possible. You could, you could specify, um, I'm not sure the best way to do it other than just a drop-down. But you, I mean, you can definitely specify a drop-down and just uh, step through each uh, value that you want. So I actually, it's a, it's a good question because the other day I saw an example um, where there was a, someone was using a leaflet, which is part of our tracks, and it's a map, uh, and it allows you to, as you zoom in on the map, it updates uh, all of the listings of cities that are actually visible. So you can do it, it takes a lot more massaging, but you can use uh, things like that to drive, as inputs basically, to drive outputs.
So, uh, so what are the typical business cases where you are asked to build something like this? Yeah, so the, the ones I showed between the, the Twitter example, but really the, uh, the mapping one was a big one. So let me just bring that up again. So the big thing here is, you know, our CEO kept saying, I want to see map and I want to see wind share or I want to see winds. And at the time we were going through some turnover, obviously hiring the developers is hard. We weren't able to just get it up there for him for somewhere that he can see and play with the data. So that's one instance. Um, I was like, well, I can use Google Viz, I've got the data, I can query our Amazon Redshift instance, and he can go through now and select you know, the different uh, carriers. Uh, you can go ahead and level the playing field, so to speak. So Verizon is doing really well in all these areas, but what if we only look at areas where everyone has at least 90% 3G coverage? So this was a cool thing you could do too as well. Chinese loading, uh, or while it's busy, you can specify this little animated loader so that people aren't just sitting there waiting. Okay, so it doesn't look like they're, they're doing anything too crazy up here because they actually, um, they're the only ones that have coverage up in Montana and this region. So now you actually see, well, where are they really doing well where everyone else has a fair shot because they all have 90% 3G coverage. So this is another instance where we can quickly add these options. Uh, I think that was one of the gotchas or the what ifs that our CEO came up with. He said, he came back and he said, well, I want to see it with comparable 3G. So that was an option that I could just quickly add. Um, it's also really useful for internal tools. So you might have a business analyst or any type of analyst that needs uh, access to the data in a way that would help them either on the client site or with their own just day to day work. And this is also a really cool way to just internally visualize your data, interact with it, and give them the tools they need to just do their day to day job. So, to deliver this to when you set up the whatever server UI you have to have our files on his PC, you gave them a script to get off or something? No, I, I, we configured our Shiny server on uh, Amazon. Uh, EC2 instance, ah. and then I can just literally send him a URL. Yeah. Thank you. Is it, uh, is that yeah, so our AWS, this one actually is, um, even though I'm, I'm local right now, I'm actually calling our Amazon Redshift instance. So in our production version, that does the same thing. It's, it's making a uh, choosing R PostgreSQL to query the data live and bring it back. And the next step is I actually want to configure, uh, it's called Laundry, and what that does is it allows you to query an OLAP queue, which when I run queries like this, it will cache the results uh, on the front end so that the data's there, it's much faster to go back to that data. That's, kind of, that's the next step.
for the predictive analytics draw, I have a couple of names I'll throw in. And if some guy is there, just, just let me know. Thomas Emerson. Eileen Butler. Raymond Venegas. Nice. Thank you.